Okay. 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 Thanks for the for the nice words, Savas, and thanks for for this invitation. This is a this is a group I've been tracking and reading the papers uh, for a long time. So it's a it's a great pleasure to 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 talk with you guys and 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 present this uh, this work here in this in this crowd. So I I'm going to talk to about uh, about uh, how we deploy the fuel systems here in Brazil and the lessons uh, we have learned from these systems. And there are two kinds of talks I could prepare here. One is this, this kind of Caprese salad talk where you, you have very fresh and small amount of ingredients and, you, and then they are very flavored and so on. And there is this other kind of talk where, where it's the all you can eat talk where you offer everything and, and kind of uh, point out the references and a bunch of uh, stuff we have done uh, deploying the systems. So I chose the all you can eat talk. Hope you guys enjoy. Uh, usually I prefer the, the Capra salad to learn more about the specific content, but we have done a lot of stuff in this space. I kind of, okay, let's summarize the whole story and, and in one talk and, and see if this is, this go well. Okay, so, uh, we started uh, with this, this in mind, uh, that counter misinformation is a kind of adversarial fight where uh, in one election, uh, you have uh, some, some, some sort of attacks and, and systems that are, are abused by misinformation campaigns. And in the next election in another country, uh, things happen a bit different. Sometimes uh, lessons are learned by the platforms or governments or, or, or researchers. And, and defenses are deployed, and then new kind of attacks, new kind of media emerge, and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of adversarial fight where, where things are, get adapted after each election. And as a researcher in this area, I, I was trying to enter in this field more heavily. I have worked with bots and other stuff in the past, spam and so on, but this was totally new. Uh, the, the U.S. election in 2016 was something really new for me, and I, I honestly, in, in the, the following, um, in 2017, I was really trying to understand how could people believe in such kind of things, how, because I was in Brazil, I was not, I was not leaving that election uh, at a whole, like, like people in the U.S., so I was really trying to understand what happened how people could be living things like the Pizzagate story and things like that, right? I, I couldn't understand that at that point. Now I keep, I keep trying to explain people how people believe in some certain things in Brazil. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, now I, I could see with my own eyes after the two years, uh, 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 the election that happened in Brazil in 2018. So that's, that's the kind of, adversarial fight we, we, we have, right? We had some problems in the United States to try to learn with that problems and then deploy real systems here in Brazil that could fight the problems in US, that happened in US. So uh, what, what we uh, uh, worried about in 2017 uh, was about, was, was this uh, ads in Facebook. Um, and not only in Facebook, but actually Facebook was the, the most used platform. All of, most of them use this, this, this kind of uh, micro target and so on. But, but we were worried about these Russian ads that were run in the United States. Uh, uh, this, this kind of things I said, okay, we need really to prepare something for the US, for the Brazilian election, uh, trying to prevent this, this kind of problem. So uh, just, just to briefly explain for those that, that are not familiar with this kind of uh, problem, let, let me explain how Facebook ads work. So this is a small city that I live here in, uh, in Minas Gerais. Uh, it's, it's close to Belo Horizonte, it's a very small city. And if you want to target, uh, to make an advertise to, to, to these people in the city, you can just select a region or a city or, or an area. Uh, and then you can choose the age of people or the gender and a bunch of other things like uh, high, high school, uh, uh, income level, or if things like religion or, and so on. There's a, a bunch of, of potential interests. And Facebook then says, okay, there is this amount of people with this, uh, this profile, and then you can target, you, send, you can send uh, an ad. 
this is a fantastic tool uh, to, to advertise uh, anything. Uh, but but of course, for political ads, it can become uh, it can bring a lot of issues that maybe the governments and many people are not prepared for that. So we started we started to to, to explore this this kind of tool and and try to understand to reason about how this could be exploited and so on. And take a look at on the amount of things that Facebook offers to advertisers. Right, it's a lot of stuff like. Uh, uh, you can you can target people, for example, that uh, have interests, and these interests are something that that Facebook infers based on 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 the user behavior, like addicted or or uh, same sex relationship and things like that. You can target people using these things. Uh, we have accounted uh, 100 and one uh, 100, 1, 100 attributes uh, from this first part, and and from the second part that that gets these interests. We have we have but uh, much more. So you can think about how you can slice and dice the, the, the population and target some very specific things and, and, and how this can be powerful for marketing and uh, uh, political marketing, right? So we, get, we got this data from uh, the House of Democrats about the Russian ads and analyze it to, to get a better comprehension about what happened uh, with those kind of ads and, and, and in that kind of attack. Uh, this is a work with, with people in Max Planck that I was doing a sabbatical year uh, in 2017 there, where I started to explore these things. And, and we, uh, so a, a few, uh, this is the, the all you can eat talk, right? So what we can learn from here is that uh, these ads were, were posted along three years. So it was not something posted immediately uh, close to the election. The click-through rate on those ads uh, related to politics and the ads posted by a Russian campaign, uh, he received 10, 10 times more uh, uh, clicks than a typical Facebook ad, which is one of the highest in the market. And the topics uh, are divisive. At, at least for me, I was expecting something target more one candidate or another. The things were about race, the things were about religion, about uh, any things that are, let's say, divisive and not necessarily fake news. Um, we, we shared the ads and the attributes and the, 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 all the information that we, we crawled from these ads in a, in a system to, you know, to bring more, more data to, to, to about them. Uh, so when I came back to Brazil after this, uh, starting uh, 2018, and this was the year, uh, for the election in Brazil, I, I decided to take a, a different approach with my team and my group uh, in which I would try as much as I could to really fix the problem and not only to do the scientific papers. So this was my first time, for example, writing uh, 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 an opinion article in, in the main newspaper here in Brazil. And this opinion article, this, this one uh, in Folha de São Paulo that, I, that is on your left, so the fake news and uh, 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 so this is this is uh, this article uh, was written with two uh, professors of the law school here in Brazil, uh, and I was uh, together with them. We were analyzing if political ads made in Facebook or this kind of uh, micro target, uh, if the law in Brazil was prepared for this. So in short, uh, in Brazil you can make an ad. Uh, a, a, a person cannot make an ad in, in a period that is close to the election. Actually, this person, if, you, if he wants to, to make an ad that is political, uh, that is uh, promoting a candidate or something, you can, you can do it, but you need to, to send the money to the political party and the political party is allowed to do. It. So you can make a donation, but you cannot run the ad, the ad by yourself. This is easily controlled in TV and radio, but it's quite complicated to control in Facebook. Uh, or any any other uh, platform like this, because then you can pulverize, you can you can make a lot of people making the ads, the political ads, uh, uh, spreadly across the platform, and this is micro target, right? To certain people, to certain regions, it's hard to track and so on. We wrote an article about this, saying that it would be a mess, and and received a lot of attention. Impressively, uh, immediately I received an invitation to go to the Brazilian Senate and and present the problem. 
I, I was really surprised with the, the real attention that we received with this opinion article. And we start to present those things and, and come up with potential solutions and discussing uh, regulation, things like this. I, I as computer science, I, I don't know too much about regulation. It's hard for me to propose something, but I was trying to propose systems and, and, and discussing brainstorming with my students, my colleagues, how to fix the problem and how to bring at least some way to mitigate the problem. So uh, I, I, I was working with people in Max Planck and one I especially had this uh, work uh, related to ad analyst. It's a tool they already had de uh, deployed uh, that, that gathers ads from volunteers. Uh, it's a browser plugin that you install on your uh, Chrome or, or Firefox and, and, you do, and, and people donate their ads that they see to a database, right? So I convinced, I, I talked to Juan, I said, let's deploy this in Brazil because it's perfect, the perfect context. And, and then um, we created this public database of Facebook ads and their targets here in Brazil. Uh, as a way to bring some transparency, right? So just some uh, example of the kind of information that we, we gather from, from volunteers with these plugins and uh, who is the advertiser. So this is uh, some ad, that, that real ad that we crawl it. Uh, when the ad was run and what is the ad about? This is the real content of the ad. And who was the target? And this is the basic explanation from Facebook uh, that is very generic and not that precise. It's not precise. It doesn't tell everything. It just say, oh, you're receiving this ad because you are an adult and you're leaving Brazil. Actually, there's much more on the, on the target formula, the, the target equation that they the, that was created by the, the advertiser. So, anyways, we we were kind of provoking this change and, and debating and, and see and and especially at that time, Facebook uh, in a uh, ju just to add one more thing. Uh, we were able to have 2,000 people who installed this thing in Brazil, uh, especially after a BBC article explaining our efforts to bring transparency and so on. I, and there was a lot of people who, okay, this is big, this is a way to bring some transparency in, and so on and installed our plugin uh, just to help. And uh, one, one interesting thing is that uh, in this kind of article, article, for example, from BBC, uh, Facebook said that they wouldn't be able to implement uh, these things uh, by the election in Brazil. And, and we start to pressure for that change, right? Why? The, the election is in Brazil. What is the problem? Can we help? Uh, how, can, how can we do these things? Uh, by the end of the day, Facebook has deployed before the election in Brazil. And, and uh, uh, this, they, they created a um, uh, Facebook ad library, they, was, they were already preparing this outside Brazil, but they were able to implement in Brazil uh, quickly and before the election. So uh, how does that work to fit with the Brazilian law? Uh, a candidate in Brazil needs to declare that they are doing a political uh, ad, especially when it's in the election period, which is around the election uh, um, day. And, and the amount of money they spend on these things become public and so on. So Facebook was helping with uh, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court responsible for election in Brazil here. And they were collaborating in this information, for example, uh, what is the, the kind of social security number or the number for the party, the political party or the candidate uh, becomes public and the amount of money they spend inside the platform with the ads become public. So. Uh, it was a big victory, let's say. Uh, key problems with this approach. It's self-declared political ads. So it works for those that are uh, doing the right thing. But actually, if you want to run a campaign, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, is, that is a campaign with fake news or, or an illegal campaign, uh, you can still run and say that the ad is not political ads, right? So it doesn't go to this database and doesn't go to, to this track of, of amount of money that was spent. So there is a still a big, a big failure in the process uh, uh, by the end of the day. But this change kind of, I, I would say the following, this, all these chains that were promoted and, and the new rules for, for making ads in, in Facebook and so on, uh, uh, I think that, that helped to uh, make, make politicians and, and those interested in, in, 
in uh, misinformation campaigns to not abuse this space. They saw that there was some movement on this on these platforms and these things to, to track them and so on. They, they okay, let's not abuse Facebook. There was not too many problems in this platform in that election, although the problems are imminent. They can still happen. Okay, how can we still help this this thing right on this space? Uh, at this at that point after the election, we we could crawl political ads from this Facebook ad library. And we could, uh, at, in large scale, right? And then we could train a, a, a classifier using, using even deep learning because we had a lot of data uh, from political ads that are real political ads, right? We trained an algorithm and then uh, we were able to identify suspicious campaigns in the ads donated by those volunteers with our, uh, with our system. Uh, with, with ad analysts, and then we were able to find a, a bunch of, of suspicious campaigns on that space. This was a paper we have published on dub, dub, dub this uh, last year, and we, and, and we also showed this to a group of, of uh, prosecutors in Brazil, and, and we are helping them with these tools we have developed to identify political ads to identify political suspicious campaigns for the next election. We are kind of giving our tools to them for, because then they can run and, and, and really do something with this, this suspicious campaign, right? Uh, any, any justice is reactive. You need, you need prosecutors to actually uh, say that the, the Z is illegal and then the justice can do something, right? So we are collaborating with them. I think this is a, a nice way for us to, to bring the, the, the social impact of the work uh, to practice. Uh, this collaboration with prosecutors. Okay, so moving to the other system, which was maybe the one that that uh, received uh, more attention here in Brazil, we we had sorry we had this idea of expose campaigns inside WhatsApp. We had let let me just briefly talk about this. We actually had uh, a few other systems. These two were the most important ones uh, by the end of the day. But uh, uh, they, uh, the entire idea of our project was to just bring transparency. We we're just opening some, uh, you know, some black boxes like what's going on in terms of ads in Facebook, what's going on inside uh, these public groups in WhatsApp, and open this to to journalists or or to to you know just to try to to unveil the music where the misinformation campaigns can be, um, and then. WhatsApp, we did the following. We're carefully about creating this system. Let me explain what, what it does and exactly uh, how we have created it. Uh, first, we have focused, we have done this for Brazil and then replicated this in India uh, with the help of Kiran Garimela from MIT and also in Indonesia. But actually it was really run in Brazil. The other ones we basically crawled data and put in a system, but did not uh, in interact too much with journalists. It helped us much more in terms of research purpose to validate some findings for different countries than actually help it, uh, journalists. But in Brazil, we really uh, interacted with journalists and, and provided them data uh, for fact checking and so on. So just a view of the system, what it is. Uh, it basically is a trending topic inside WhatsApp. Uh, it shows the most popular videos, the most popular image, the most popular message and URLs, audios of a day or of a period. Right, so here we are seeing the videos. I'm just browsing here the videos. You can actually see the video itself, or you can actually uh, show the, the 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 number of groups it appears in. And and if you can, if you want to, you can see which groups. If you click on that groups part, you can see which groups it appeared. Right. So we open this to journalists uh, with an editorial line. Uh, this was our role for them to access the system. Fact checkers, five fact checkers agents uh, asked for, for access here, and many of them uh, cited our, our monitor system saying where, where they found the, the, the content. And researchers after the election, we opened to researchers, especially from communications there, and they want to understand the ideas to understand what happened. So uh, how it works quickly, uh, we search for for groups for this URLs chat.whatsapp.com uh, in Google and in, in Twitter. So basically the idea is to get groups that are uh, that were indexed by search engines that are, let's say public. 
uh, we found a lot of groups. We, we did this multiple times, right? We found a lot of groups and we selected a few because we had limited, limited uh, resource, uh, basically limited number of cell phones. And we joined those groups. Then we get the data from WhatsApp web uh, uh, later. Just to show that it's a bit complex, like we need to do some parts that are not automatic, like finding the groups and, and join the, the groups with cell phones. And then we need to export this database process these databases and, and then find uh, which image is similar, which video is similar, which audio is similar, and then set up the system. And we are, of course, anonymizing this data and so on. So it's moving, it is uh, one of the systems that you need to move data from here to there a lot and, and takes a lot of uh, big infrastructure and, and space and, and a lot of work from students because, you know, uh, uh, APIs uh, stop working and all these kind of things. So. A few concerns uh, and design strategies that we had and ethical issues that we had to deal with. Uh, first, uh, all the personal data is processed and stored anonymously. Uh, so what we put in the system is basically the content that is getting popular and not um, that the content that was shared in many groups and not the one specific content and we avoid uh, identifying people. Uh, the system uh, basically shows what appears in, in public groups. And we limited access to, to a, a few people that we could trust. I, I don't know, maybe this data could help, for example, uh, to expose someone. Uh, we found some, some case of pornography or we, we, we wouldn't open this system to anyone to avoid uh, this kind of uh, exposure that we're not predicting. And, and second, uh, we, we run this, uh, we passed this project in, in IRBs uh, from MIT and MPI, which, which were our collaborators in, in most of the papers we have done, we couldn't obtain uh, this kind of IRB here in Brazil, not because we, we didn't even apply it because it's more, this, the, the, the process is more prepared for service and this kind of things we couldn't even apply. Uh, and one thing that we always say to anyone that we share is that we don't know how representative this data is from the entire system. This is basically uh, a best effort to monitor uh, things. Currently, the system is running with more than 500 active groups uh, and that we are monitoring. So a few things that we have learned. Uh, see, th this, this was, let's say, we, we set up the system and we opened to journalists, so we were learning what was going on from them. We basically were trying to keep up the system running. So there was this, this interesting uh, 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 story from BBC in which they say what we learned from one week inside the system and, and basically wrote a very nice piece uh, sharing what they saw and, and fact checking a few things and so on. Uh, there was a few stories, I'm, there was dozens of stories, I'm just getting some that I, I learned more. Um, there is this, this one uh, saying that most of the images touch on divisive topics this really reminds me our our work that we started to in this in this area of misinformation uh, on the Russian ads because we were really seeing this kind of attack here in Brazil. Uh, for example, uh, putting uh, uh, feminists against the church and things like that, right? At the, so uh, there was a bunch of misinformation in terms of fake images like. Uh, uh, I'm circulating here this guy who is stabbed, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who is the current pre Brazilian president. And, and there was this picture in which they put his head uh, close to Lula, former Brazilian president, kind of saying that these guys were connected somehow. This was a fake picture. And then journalists need to find out the real picture and just there is a small change here and there. And this thing circulated heavily uh, inside WhatsApp and you know how, how these things work. And then uh, there was this, uh, see, here's another news. Uh, it's basically an HTML edit from a, from a real news in which the guys get the HTML, edit it, and send the picture through WhatsApp, right? And, and one thing that we should add here is that many of the data plans here for cell phones in Brazil, they, they come with uh, free, unlimited, not free, unlimited in terms of data use. Uh, unlimited uh, WhatsApp and Facebook and, and Instagram. But, but then uh, you have limited access to fact check 
fact check uh, 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 websites and things like this. So people could receive in WhatsApp this fake image and then they could not even check uh, if that things were, were uh, true or not, right? They could not open the real site and see this, the news was there. 80% uh, 80, 80 of the most shared emails in the electoral period were fake or misleading. And this was not us saying, but actually we asked the fact check agents to check for us. They wrote a story and gave us the data, which we used in, in, in a paper. And see, 88% of the top 50 emails, it's a lot. So what we, we could learn how these things work in, in WhatsApp, how, how this, this became a system to, 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 to reach everyone. Um, part of what I'm saying, we were able to measure here. There is a connection here. There is a, uh, what are, we are saying here is we are showing users connected by groups. So we can see that there is a path uh, from groups uh, based because users are connected in more than one group. So there is a path through which information can propagate. But uh, part of what, I, part of what I, I'm going to say here is, is some speculation. Uh, basically, what I saw is that Jair Bolsonaro uh, was very successfully in uh, going to different countries or different uh, uh, cities and states, visiting people. And in each visit, uh, his staff was kind of getting uh, people's name and say, oh, we are creating this WhatsApp group. Why don't you lead this WhatsApp group for us? We are going to share content with you and you can share it with your colleagues and so on. So people really felt like we are helping the campaign uh, and created these public groups of activists and they are real people trying to support a candidate and they receive content that is fake and, and basically they don't care to share because they want the, the, the guy to be elected. So they are more susceptible to spread misinformation. This somehow creates this backbone uh, of, of information propagation uh, that was able to reach the private groups later. That's why I'm saying that I'm speculating. We never look at any private information, like private groups, anyone. But, 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 but we, we were having this, this uh, idea as we were exploring this, this data. Uh, I made this video as a, a GIF uh, for you to see. And this is uh, Jair Bolsonaro just before the election, during the campaign, showing a cell phone with a bunch of WhatsApp groups. And each time you can see a lot of movement in the groups because each time a message arrives, the groups go to the top. So can you imagine how fast uh, messages are arriving in those groups? Uh, uh, so that it passed so so fast, and and he was bragging about the many existing groups supporting him and so on. Basically, the cell phone probably is from his campaign, uh, and they are connected with uh, a bunch of groups. There was a journalist showing uh, a few companies that do mass uh, uh, posts, uh, massive posts in in WhatsApp groups uh, if you pay them and so on and. Uh, there was a bunch of, of those. Uh, it was suspicious that there was this massive uh, uh, accounts that post automatically. But actually, if, if some a, a few people working on this uh, staff could send a, a bunch of messages to activists and then reach the entire network quickly. So in the very end of the election, uh, we decided to write a new opinion article. Uh, it was, it appeared in New York Times. I wrote with uh, Christina Tardagla and Pablo, and we uh, were basically suggesting to that WhatsApp should uh, limit virality features to, to reduce, to, to allow a reasonable debate in the Brazilian election at that point. Uh, the virality features were the problem. If you think about what I'm saying, the title here, the WhatsApp paradox. Uh, the paradox here is that somehow WhatsApp is creating this, this privacy message platform, right? This platform created for, pri for, for, for privacy, uh, private message where uh, things are encrypted end to end. But then uh, they bring a lot of uh, virality features that allow potentially the, the, a message can reach the entire uh, network and, and become public. 
right? A message can, what defines the public and private? If, if a certain number of people see that message becomes public, what, what is this threshold that, that I could say, okay, this is a private conversation, this is a public conversation? Because things can get viral and can reach a bunch of people, can reach the entire network uh, uh, theoretically. So it creates this paradox and that's where uh, the campaigns were exploiting because we cannot track who started, you cannot see, uh, who is posting those things, but then it can reach everyone and it can become a public discourse, right? And, and then we were suggesting to limit uh, viral features. There was a case in Ninja in which WhatsApp had already uh, made some limitations. We were expecting that they could do uh, in time for Brazil, but they said it was not possible uh, to do it quickly. Uh, but they did later and, and for, for, for the entire, uh, uh, for, for the, the entire world, they limited the, the, the size, um, the, the limit in the forward was, was basically five. And, and, and then uh, later, uh, actually, actually they did one more thing, they, they removed it, they were able to ban 100,000 accounts in, in Brazil, two days after we wrote this piece. And, and then in January, they, they created this limit in forward to five. And we could see WhatsApp taking actions in different elections later. For example, in Spain, they removed uh, uh, the, the communication of an entire party and so on. Uh, this is what I'm saying, that the adversarial fights, right? We couldn't fight the things in Brazil, but then maybe for other elections, this kind of things become uh, less, less vulnerable, this kind of system. So we did a work later uh, in which we, we were trying to see if this limit on on, on message forward was sufficient. And, and basically the conclusion is that uh, it, it is a good, a good thing, but actually for viral content, it's not. We actually have used this now very known uh, kind of models, simple models of, of uh, susceptible exposure. In fact, that everyone is get, got familiar with the, this pandemic situation. And we, we were playing with simulations uh, on different scenarios and, and say, okay, when, when there is a lot of virality in the content, it's hard to stop it to, to, to reach the internet network quickly. And, and then we showed this to WhatsApp and say, oh, they said, okay, we are working something uh, better. And later they came with this solution in which they identify something that is viral and then they limit the, 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 the highly forward message. They prevent them to spread, right? And, but okay, WhatsApp did this without too much transparency. They just are, they don't say exactly what they mean by, by a lot of virality and, and so on. But anyways, they implemented something um, that can help in this scenario. But, but see, one thing, if you, if you receive a content that is very, uh, that is limited, you can just propagate to one person. You can actually download this content in your phone and it creates a new hash, and then you can forward to anyone you want uh, and, until your new hash becomes viral. So it's, it's still uh, not solved. Okay, we have proposed something, uh, let's say not only to point out the problems, but actually to try to bring some solutions. And this is a, a, a work in which we propose uh, to bring uh, a, a client side solution. Uh, fact checking to the client side. Basically, uh, fact checkers could store a hash and this, this algorithm for creating the hash of the content that was fact checked should go to, uh, should be the same that WhatsApp would use. Uh, and then uh, in, the, in the cell phone, not, not uh, see, uh, just in the cell phone of the user, uh, you could check that this information was already fact checked and, and, and then pop up with something saying to the user, okay, uh, this information was checked, I will show you what you spread or things like that, right? Or this information you are, you are receiving was checked um, uh, in this place, you want to click on, on this and so on. We, we proposed this uh, and we show with our data that this would prevent 40% of the shares containing misinformation in our data in Brazil and, and could prevent 82% in the data that we have for India that was also fact-checked. Uh, and of course, it doesn't change the encryption at all. It's just in the cell phone of the user, right? So, and also Facebook has this, uh, this network of fact-checkers across the entire world. So I'm just saying that they could try to use the same infrastructure. And of course, 
this needs change and requires some, uh, maybe it affects uh, public perception, right? People, people that receive some message say, oh, this content was fake, might think that WhatsApp is inspecting their message. There is a bunch of things for them to test and we are academics, we can just propose idea and let them to, to deal with this, right? We are just proposing some idea here. I, I know that, that deploying is, is a different stuff and, and might be require more, more uh, from the company. Okay, one more thing. This is a work with Savas uh, and, and the group in, in, um, in Max Planck. Uh, as well, one of the problems that is the virality, but, but the others is this idea of creating this public space, uh, groups that are public inside uh, and in, based on private message. This is a kind of contradictory stuff. And so let's look at this public space, but not, let's look not only to WhatsApp. No, let's look at Telegram, Discord, and other platforms because somehow uh, uh, they might uh, offer problems as well. And we are, let's say, just, just uh, uh, reaching uh, here WhatsApp. So things we have learned, for example, uh, WhatsApp, this public group, they exposed five, uh, 55,000 uh, uh, phone numbers. And now in the data that we have crawled from public groups, uh, basically 100% of all the, the, the uh, users inside those groups, we could get the phone numbers because WhatsApp exposed this, right? So we are pointing out that uh, this idea of public groups expose people, at least people's numbers, uh, phone numbers, right? Other uh, private information uh, could be disclosed in, in Discord and Telegram. Uh, for example, uh, the identification of the person in a social networks or sometimes in mail, things like this. Uh, we Take, we, we crawl at this in Twitter, right? And, and we, then we run a topic model on the tweets that come with these invitations for public groups. And we found, if you look at the middle of the table uh, about Telegram, uh, you have sex, uh, uh, groups related to sex, and we have a large amount. Uh, it's not here in the table, but we also have a non-negligible fractions of groups related to sex in WhatsApp and Discord. So, uh, if you think, uh, we couldn't look at into this data uh, to see what there is inside those groups, but it's, it's see, there's so many, so much uh, pornography in, in the web, why people would exchange things in private groups. There should be something more in those uh, kind of content. So we, we talked with some, some uh, prosecutors here in Brazil about this result, showed them, and they got very interested in trying to find out child pornography in these groups related to sex, and, and we are uh, sharing with them uh, our tools to get this data. See, this is not the kind of research we could do inside the university. We could not even crowd this kind of data, uh, uh, but, but it, for them, it's something that they could do uh, and try to uh, find out these, these, these bad guys. So we shared our tools with them and everything to crawl WhatsApp and, and, and those, those systems. Uh, WhatsApp and Telegram actually, not Discord. They were more interested in Telegram data and WhatsApp data. So, okay, I'm almost almost finishing. Just uh, just to say that this misinformation machine inside WhatsApp is still active and running in Brazil. I will show some some situation here uh, that's already getting a bit old, but uh, that happened after the election. So we had this system still running. And at a certain point, the Minister of the Education start to, uh, they, they made a bunch of, uh, uh, they uh, slashed the, the, the funds of, of the universities. And then he made a bunch of uh, accusations uh, on the university saying they, they were doing a mess. There was a bunch of uh, naked people inside the universities. I, 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 never, I was never invited to one of those parties where people are naked inside the universities. Really, these things do not happen. And, and then, uh, they said people were using marijuana and things like that. A bunch of things. There was ah, there was a bunch of of, of lies on on these things. And what was surprising is it came from the minister of the education. Can you see what's going on in Brazil right now, right? And what was surprising is was that uh, WhatsApp was flooded with messages uh, attacking universities, kind of supporting the minister of education's accusation. So. I was really surprised when I saw that. And at that point, journalists were not tracking too much the, the content inside our system. I was really surprised. And usually I have this position of not 
position myself uh, in, in terms of uh, candidates or, or political opinions, because we are running a project on, on misinformation and we are trying to not uh, pick sides, uh, uh, you know, to avoid any, any confusion with this. And, but, but at, at this point, it was attacking my, my, my workplace, right? My university and things like this. I, I was really angry with the situation. And I posted something on, on Facebook saying that uh, in WhatsApp, there was a bunch of uh, emails and things uh, attacking the universities. And it spread fast, my, my message. Uh, it reached a bunch of people, it got viral. And, and then two fact check agents kind of checked what I said. And I was said that there was this uh, really uh, increase in the amount of attacks in universities in the last days, but I didn't quantify. And see, uh, I was fat was quantified and, and the increase was 950% uh, uh, from one week to another, uh, just after the minister uh, uh, talked about this slashing uh, the, the fundings of the university. So, uh, uh, and, and then there was a, all this kind of uh, image of, you know, uh, it was some part of this image, they, they were took it, they, they, they were taken out of context. They were not in university. Sometimes they were in university, but they were part of a play or something like this, or a protest or something. They they were saying, okay, this is the routine. They 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 go to classes naked. This is things kind of thing. Anyway, uh, uh, all these things were debunked, and I found interesting that later some journalists uh, wrote about uh, the content that was there inside our system. Uh, in a bunch of situations, uh, for example, when government was trying to pass uh, some, uh, um, some, something to, to allow uh, selling our, uh, arms here in Brazil, selling, uh, uh, you know, a bunch, a bunch of, of, of different situations that the government was doing uh, here, uh, basically they were undoing crisis inside WhatsApp. And this is, was the point of, of this, uh, this other uh, piece uh, from, from a journalist inside our data that look in, into our data. Uh, other situations now during the pandemic, we still run the system. Uh, so uh, we are finding a lot of things related to audios. We were studying audios actually, and then we decided to share with, with some journalists for them to debunk. Uh, there was the situation where uh, during the pandemic in the very beginning, uh, there was a bunch of fake orders of people saying, oh, I'm a doctor in this hospital and, and there is no one coming with coronavirus. This is totally fake and this was created by the press or this is, this is unreal. Don't believe on that. You can, and things like this. And then uh, they debunked a bunch of those things. Uh, there was a one that says, oh, I'm a doctor in this hospital. My name is this name and so on. And then they check and there is not this kind of doc this name as, as a doctor in that hospital. And, and see, they found some videos. Sometimes people show their faces and they were able to find out a video and, and, and find out who was the person. See, this is investigative journalists. They find out, it was curious for us because we we're sharing the data with them, but then they debunk and then go ahead and find the person who said the things and they were able to talk with them and say, oh, and this person was saying, oh, uh, uh, she, she was telling how to, prevent chloroquine, uh, prevent uh, uh, COVID by using chloroquine and so on. And then he asked her uh, from where she took this information. And she said, oh, from a bunch of videos I saw on YouTube. So uh, I hope you have enjoyed sometimes this kind of talk where you, all you can eat can be hard to digest. I hope you guys have uh, uh, received a bunch of pointers and things that I have done in the last two, three years. And if you want to talk about some specific point or something, I'd be happy to, to answer and discuss later or, or now. If it's, here, here's some, just some pointers uh, to, to the project page. We are preparing a project for 2022 where there will be the next election in Brazil. And and my email and my web page in case you want to access some of these studies.